<clears throat> I think we can start now. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining this 2020 International Advocacy uh, Worship that IFFD organizes every year in some capital of the world or some city. And due to the pandemic, we couldn't uh, organize anything in person, but we, we really try to organize this every year. So we did it virtually. And we appreciate the more than 100 participants that are today and along these th three days and the more than 20 experts that will join us. And now, without further ado, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Javier Vidal Cuadras, the Secretary General of IFFD. He has been our main sponsor for this event. And I just want to uh, present to you that he's he will tell you many of the reasons why we organized this event. Javier, I'll, I'll give you the floor now. Now? Okay. Can you see me? Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Alex. Uh, good morning, everybody, from a rainy Mediterranean day in Barcelona, which is not a bad sign. It's a good, uh, it's a good start because uh, water always means uh, life. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you all, uh, you all, thank you all uh, very much for your participation in this eighth edition of the IFFD International Advocacy Workshop. Really what I would like to do in these uh, few uh, minutes is to kind of introduce you in the world of IFFD. Uh, I could say that it has been a surprise, a nice surprise, the incredible response that this call has, uh, has had, that has succeeded any the best expectation we could have uh, but i won't say it because i wouldn't be sincere really for me it it hasn't been a surprise i have been following the work of uh, alex and ignacio sofias uh, managing and promoting the advocacy work of ifd in front of un eu and other international arenas and for me this is the logical confirmation of uh, of the work uh, well done IFFD is a federation uh, made of uh, uh, more than 70 members, well, almost 70 members, because some of them uh, still don't have a, a, a legal uh, entity to be represented uh, in IFFD, but we have a presence in 70 uh, countries. <clears throat> the activity of IFFD began uh, some years before the setup of, uh, of uh, IFFD as federation in 1968, when a group of uh, fathers, in this case, attended an MBA, a, a Master in Business Administration, and they uh, decided uh, to apply the tool which, which they were being uh, trained uh, to, the, to the world of uh, family, the case study method. And they, they, they began to write some cases, they, they, write, they, uh, they wrote uh, some technical notes, and they launched the first family enrichment cross, which is our core and main activity. <clears throat> Recently, we are involved now in a, in a transformation process in IFFD in terms of managing and many other and, and, and changing many other things uh, inside the organization. And we have redefined our mission. And our mission is to generate dynamics that help each user, each person, each family mm, in the world, if possible, to discover the, the, and live the, the beauty of family life in a friendship environment that fosters personal improvement. Three key, key ideas uh, 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 for this mission. Transmitting, conveying, passing on the beauty of family life, but not in any way, but uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in, a, in a friendship ambience and promoting the personal development, the personal improvement. And we try briefly to empower families around the world. And we do this on the basis of, of, of some assumptions or uh, premises. First, non-discrimination. We do not discriminate by race, color, religion, gender, uh, country of origin of any uh, reason. Second, we try to get both parents involved in our activities, in our courses, so that each one of them makes their own contribution to an individual, parental, and family level. When we decide to share our life with, uh, with, uh, or with a partner, with another person, uh, normally we don't like to lose our 
uh, personality. We like to gain a new personality. This is why we insist on the participation of both. They have, they need, parents need to take the lead in their families. Three, we flee from imposing our own ideas or from dismissing what others may think. This is why we use this, this, this methodology. The case study method is an objective, neutral a methodology that allows uh, 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 couples and families to develop their own personal and family project. We don't want experts or gurus that uh, convey and transmit uh, to the parents some list of actions to do, some list of recipes that they are critically accept and have to apply to their families. No, we want them to, to, to work hard in their own family and personal project through this methodology, the case study method. And four, four and five, four, we try to address the family from the same family. We don't have teachers. In fact, we don't call teachers our moderators. They are really moderators. They volunteer. They are fathers and mothers of family with their own professions that are trained. We have different uh, ways and levels of, of training to moderate and to, and to guide the general sessions that we have with the, with the parents, but trying to get uh, 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 from the parents the, the, the ideas, the solutions that maybe they, they, they would know, but they, they want the parents to, uh, to, to explain. And finally, our courses try to, to target to groups of uh, parents with children of the same age. Throughout all these 50 years, we have uh, 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 tested and we have uh, contrasted that the best way uh, the, the, more efficient, the more efficient way to help families is trying to, to put together families that are in the same situation, parents that are in the same situation. And besides this, which is our core activity, obviously we do all this uh, huge uh, advocacy work in UN, in, e in the EU, and in other uh, international uh, um, arenas uh, that you will, you will uh, get to know during these days, and uh, Alex and Ignacio and Francois will explain to you. In 2011, uh, uh, the IFFD was uh, upgraded from the uh, special consultative status in United Nations, in the Economic and Social Council in United Nations, to uh, the general uh, consultative status, which is a, 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 a grade, uh, which is, or a status, which is reserved uh, for large international NGOs whose, which uh, activities cover or almost cover most of the issues and the areas of the agenda of ECOSOC. Normally, these are fairly large and established international, N, uh, international NGOs as uh, EFF, uh, IFFD uh, is. And during all these years, especially from 2011, we have, we have been developing our, our own style of talking about uh, the family. <clears throat> we try first to integrate a family perspective into national, regional, and international development agendas through the design and implementation of evidence-based law, laws, policies, and programs. We don't want to instrumentalize the family we, don't, we avoid any ideological approach to the family. We always lean and are supported by facts, by data, by reports, by studies. We, we try to, 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 to follow this scientific approach uh, to the family, to, to really discern and get to know the, the, the truth of the family. We are a federation of non-governmental, non-denominational, non-profit, independent and private uh, members, which are the family and treatment centers that we have throughout the world, 70 countries and more than 250 family and treatment centers in 250 cities uh, uh, in the world. Um, and uh, these centers and our advocacy work, we think, reflects all those characteristics, non-governmental, non-denominational, non-profit, and so on. And, so on. and now, Alex uh, uh, can develop this idea, and probably will do it in, 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 during these days, we are, uh, we are currently working on the, the introduction and the diffusion uh, of the term uh, parenting education, which may be not recognized with this word, but this is that, but has been present in the history of mankind because always parents uh, have been transmitting a series of uh, standard experiences, guidelines uh, from one generation to the next uh, generation. 
but maybe not always in a systematic or verified or contrasted way. This is what uh, the, the, one of the goals we have now uh, uh, in front. Um, so finally, I don't want to take uh, more time that I was uh, granted. There are many ways to reach out and to help uh, families. Our way of doing family, let's say, uh, uh, is just one more. We try to help families by offering them uh, what we think is a preventive, if, uh, an effective preventive tool that will help them, the couples and the family, uh, to get or to achieve the goals that, that every person and every family wants, that is to keep uh, loving and making each other happy. This is our, our uh, ultimate uh, goal in IFFD, in all the areas, in all the activities uh, we, uh, we start. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for coming, for, uh, for attending. Um, this is a workshop on advocacy, on international advocacy, uh, and we encourage those of you that uh, during this day can connect with our style of doing family to keep in touch with us, through Alex, through Ignacio, or through uh, what, uh, whatever other uh, via it's uh, uh, helpful. So thank you very much, uh, Alex. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, for attending. Or other uh, via it's uh, uh, helpful. So thank you very much, uh, Alex. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody, for attending. Morning, good afternoon, afternoon, and good evening to everyone. We salute your attendance today. Uh, for the second day of the International, International Advocacy Workshop, we are more than 100 participants and 20 experts from all over the world. And we also appreciate your strongly involvement in the discussions yesterday, which was very enriching for the topics discussed and also for the final statements. The theme, the theme of this day is youth transitions. And the, the agreed statements, statement of this day were constructed by groups four, which is composed from members from Brazil and Cape Verde, and also group three with members from Netherlands and Sweden. Uh, we, we remember you to comment the, on the unified statement, which is available for everyone, and the folder which we all have access uh, in, up to the interval before the discussion, not during the discussion. So keep in mind that as the speakers are giving their points on the topic, you should also uh, write your suggestions on the document before the discussions, okay? That's the practice we are advising you for today. Also, tomorrow, the opening speech will be by uh, Renata Katzmarska, which is the focal point on the family on the United Nations, and she's going to speak how to work at United Nations. So many of you may have this dream of working at United Nations, so you can, you can think about your questions and what you want to, to ask her tomorrow in advance. And also, if you want to send a question on this topic in advance, please send us in the chat. Be, feel free for that. Okay. Well, now I want to give the ground for eight minutes to Ana Margarita. Ana Margarita Romero de Vils, who is the director of the Family Institute at the Universidad de La Sabana and also a message in human, human resource management. They are the expected co-organizers, well, they are the, the co-organizers for the years and are the expected co-organizers for next editions. Please, Ana Margarita, Ana Margarita, take the ground for the next 80 minutes. Thank you, Rodolfo. Uh, can you please uh, give me a um, minute to manage the presentation, please? Well, thank you very much uh, for this invitation. I want to share with you some uh, framework and, and research that the scholars of the Family Institute have been working on. Um, in the case of Colombia, this is a country with uh, 48 million people, um, as well as many other countries in the region, uh, for sure, and, and the whole world. 
this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has changed our, our daily life. Uh, parents have had to assume an intense role assisting their children, particularly uh, by acting as teachers. Uh, workload has increased for everyone, including attending house chores. <laughs> Many companies have gone bankrupt, which has uh, generated job loss. Um, uh, others have become ill or have a, a family member loss. Um, all of these indeed uh, has increased tensions in family daily life and relations. Uh, this situation uh, has an overall impact on SDGs 1, 3, 4, 5, and 11. Government and universities, as well as many professionals and community service, among others, um, uh, with this uh, joint advocacy policy on families, have studied um, and implemented uh, and implemented programs and support aids related to public health, economic, and social aspects. For example, last week uh, in an educational program to promote love parenting practices organized by the Childhood and Adolescence Counseling Government Agency in Colombia and our institute gathered more than 9,500 assistants, mainly state officials of, of the country. Hmm? Um, after more than five months of isolation, longer than, than most countries, schools remain closed uh, through, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean region. Um, according to the, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, since the pandemic began, Latin America has lost more than 26 million jobs. Uh, this data shows a deeper recession that is hitting the region among other regular programs such as poverty, poor quality education, and inequality. Uh, within this context, um, uh, the Family Institute has a faculty staff of 43 professors of different areas of knowledge and research in order to provide solutions uh, to society problems. Um, as, as we see, uh, it's a reality that this pandemic has increased many ch challenges around family life. Parents in a sudden has to face multiple situations um, and stress demands to attend all of the same time, work, housework, childcare, just to, just to name a few of them. Um, the monthly family conference, for example, that we have, the webinars, the IFA tips posted weekly on Twitter, Facebook, or, or Instagram during the pandemic have reached more than 13 million people, amount never reached before in any of, other of, of our activities. Family work integration uh, creates tensions, uh, uncertainty, uncertainty, and fear. Uh, but both of them are realities of our life, and it's a it's a it's wrong to try to to make uh, or to fight against them. Um, three professors of the institute conducted a social isola isolation experiences in the family due to COVID uh, nineteen research very recently, which will be implemented to, in Argentina, Chile as well. I would like to share with you some preliminary findings. Um, um, this is a quantitative study with 102 questions uh, in a Likert scale. Um, data shows that three out of 10 mothers, when a child makes a mistake, she loses patience and jail, while one out of 10 fathers do the same. Mothers are three times more overloaded than men in their child school activities than before COVID. More than uh, more than double of, my, of my women compared the men compared to the men agree or totally agree that they are affected on how they will survive financially during and after quarantine. Uh, families have changed uh, their consumed patterns in food, alcoholic beverage, cigarettes, medicines, um, social networks, shopping, um, movies, among others. And regarding especially social network usage, 44% of the participants indicated that they use it a lot. 84% of the participants uh, agreed or totally agreed that they need to have quality of family life. Uh, female twice as men. There is more data in this uh, study. I just wanted to share you some, some information. Remote working, um, remote working has been proposed as a strategy to facilitate work and family life. However, it, all, it also has disadvantages associated with um, increasing working hours right now. 
um, a recent Harvard Business Review states that the ideal, the ideal worker uh, expectation uh, is uh, especially challenging for working mothers. Literature confirms that problems between work and family have a bidirectional um, relation. Uh, this uh, impl implies that family tensions could also affect the work performance of, of family members. Uh, and family conflicts have been associated with less satisfaction and uh, quality of family life. Um, for remote work, it has been a really um, a choice right now, and, and it's, it's coming to stay. Hmm? For workers, there are some benefits, as well as for, for organizations and society. Uh, for example, for workers, we can just name like freedom to plan, organize tasks, manage time for work, autonomy to recognize work and family, time management, uh, well, for organizations, productivity, performance, engagement, permanence, and profitability. For society, better ecological awareness, fewer traffic problems, especially in rush hours in Bogota or many other cities, we, we really care on that. Uh, positive impact on the family, uh, general health improvements, social inclusions. Uh, well, as, um, finally, we propose uh, the following. The creation of more programs that include family relations and parenting, mm, the collaborate actions among uh, all social sectors, government, private companies, media, and others. And third, uh, promote strategies for family counseling and support. This is a must. Mm, authors like Klicksberg or Cavallotti recognize the importance of the family for the progress of nations uh, because it transmits the values. Uh, and healthy practices. Uh, the education of people uh, contributes uh, to the form formation of emotional intelligence, uh, good, act good attitudes, uh, which together um, we promote important capacities for uh, human and, and social development. Uh, well, I hope I have been good on time. Um, and, and here are some references that we used for this uh, presentation. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana Margarita, for your insightful uh, talks right now. Maybe if you have some additional information as a, a link to provide to participants through the chat because they are really interesting. And I'm sure that it, it is going to be interesting for everyone to, to go yeah. further on this. Yes, Thank and, you and, very and, much. and follow us by uh, the social network, uh, Twitter and so on. So you can be, be after the finally um, analysis of the research and have all the complete information because it's, it's going to be compared with uh, Argentina and Chile as well. So it's, it's going to be very interesting. Really Thank good. you. So we have one question for one participant. Okay, go Cohen ahead. Vermey from Netherlands. Oh, good. He asks is, how can the negative side effects of remote work be limited? Where does the work day begin and end? Wonderful question, wonderful question. <laughs> uh, yes, this, uh, first of all, organization, uh, and try to have like separate things in your house. For example, have a schedule, have a schedule to, to wake up, and, and have a shower and, and have a time to sit on your computer and have like, like you were in your office, like, like you're, you were the regular uh, time to work, right? Uh, of course, you can be interrupted for sometimes for work if you have children, but be aware of it and just uh, try to as much as you can to get stick to your your schedule that's uh, to be organized it's, it's really the, the, the best uh, recommendation I, I can give you I, I hope that helped to your, sure, to your sure. question it helps everyone okay thank you very much and thank you for for all the words very encouraging for everyone thank yeah. you okay bye thank so, you uh, welcome to the third day of the workshop this is the last day and we're going to deal with the topic of intergenerational solidarity, as you know. The first speaker we have today is a very special one. 
Mrs. Renata Kasmaska. She works for the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. This is the focal point of the family there. She's going to make a short speech and then uh, she'll reply to some of the questions, as many as the time allows, you made it yesterday. And if there's some other question you want to make today, write it on the, on the chat box and we'll try to also cover it. So, Renata Kasmaska, thanks very much for being here. You have the floor. Um, good morning, everyone. Good evening and good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm very happy to be here um, and talk at this workshop to young people. Um, I would like to give some uh, practical advice to young people who would like to work at the United Nations. Um, I uh, would like to talk about a little bit about my experience and also uh, then ask, uh, answer the questions that I received. So, um, first of all, I am quite a veteran at the United Nations. I've been working here since 1988. Um, I, I went through uh, many departments, um, many areas of work. Uh, I used to work in the um, um, Department of Conference Services that was then called. I worked in the terminology and translation section. Um, I worked in the Department of Public Information. And um, since 2005, I've worked in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Um, and um, the, that in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, we have a division for inclusive social development, and the, and I worked on poverty issues, employment, um, and uh, since 2009, I've been working on family uh, policy issues as well as social integration, social inclusion issues. So, basically, um, our work. Um, in the family field, in other fields like aging, youth, or disability. Yes. Okay. Um, so basically, what we do is we we um, uh, we respond to the request of the third committee that issues resolutions, and we serve as the Commission for Social Development that deliberates on social um, issues at the UN, and it has a session every February. Um, so, to in order to um, provide. Um, um, advice to governments, uh, recommendations on what to do in specific social policy fields. We, we organize um, expert group meetings. We rely heavily on the knowledge of academics that we invite, uh, specialists in the fields that we want to raise awareness about. Um, we um, write reports, so reports to the, uh, to the bodies of the UN, to the third committee, to the commission, as well as other um, background papers that we think need uh, um, talking about issues that we think need more attention. Um, so for example, right now, we, um, uh, I'm working with a consultant on a, on a paper on families and technologies, which is one of the mega trends um, that um, uh, DESA um, uh, considers very important uh, moving forward. And I think Bahira will, will be talking about that uh, more today. Um, so um, my, my work is very interesting. You know, as, uh, my favorite part is probably networking with academics and civil society. Um, I, I listen to experts. Uh, I try to incorporate their views, um, their recommendations into, into re the reports. I work with member states um, um, on resolutions. Uh, I try to raise awareness on um, family issues through awareness raising meetings, uh, through conferences, also participating in conferences that I'm invited to. Um, so basically, some practical advice to give you is that there are two ways to enter the United Nations. So as a general service staff or as a professional. So um, I know that probably most of you already have an advanced degree or you are working towards it. So you would be probably interested in um, applying for, for a professional um, category job at the UN. So. Um, just to let you know that the, the system is a bit different between the UN Secretariat or UNICEF or UNDP. So let's say in the Secretariat, even if, if you start working in the general service, let's say as an entry position, you can advance through exam to the professional, which is not so easy. While in UNICEF or UNDP, you can advance upon getting the, um, uh, the degree, so without an, exa an examination. Um, and if you want to go the way of professional right away, 
you would um, you have to apply, of course, you know, there's careers at UN.org, which is um, uh, where you have three areas. You have political, human rights, and social. Um, but also, so these are the, you know, peace and security. You have the Department of Political Affairs, the Department of Peace and Operations. In, um, then you have in the economic social field, you have um, uh, Department of Economic Social Affairs, but also you have co uh, regional commissions. So the regional commissions, I, you know, depending where you live or if you would like to work in the region, you know, you, you should also consider them. So you have ECLAC in uh, Santiago, Chile. You have ECA, Economic uh, Commission for Africa. For um, in Addis Ababa, you have ESCAP in Bangkok. And there's a smaller commission uh, the, uh, in Europe, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Um, of course, you also have opportunities in other areas such as management and administration, information technology, legal, public information, conference management, internal security, safety, and logistics. Um, now, the way to, uh, you know, the, the, um, the most straightforward uh, way to enter the UN is from, for, through the Young Professional Program. So uh, this is so-called YPP. And I checked that in 2020, the YPP examinations will cover the, the following areas, the management and administration, global communications, and political affairs and human uh, rights. So these are the areas, if you have degrees in these areas, you can apply for the examination, but it's not enough to have a degree. You also, your country has to be on the list of underrepresented countries. So you have to check on the website if you uh, qualify. Also, you have to be uh, not older than 32 years old. So this is an important thing to keep in mind to enter this exam um, as early as possible. Um, so so the, the UN website is organized very well. I mean, um, I just wanted to say that it's the work in social field is very rewarding, very interesting. Um, I, um, I was trying to actually in my career trajectory, I was uh, initially interested in translation. And then I was um, very much into political science. I have also a political science degree. And in the end, I decided to go for social field. And I think um, I, it was a good decision because this field is, um, is progressing, it's moving forward. You know, um, it's very transformative field and you, you feel that you make a difference and you, you have to keep on, uh, you know, um, your knowledge about this field that's changing and, and, evo and evolving. And I think that um, the, when you look at the uh, Millennium Development Goals and the success there, and then the evolution into um, Sustainable Development Goals and all the areas that you know, need, um, need advancement, need progress, very, very, uh, enu you know, well enumerated. You can always find areas in those fields that are interesting for you and you can um, try to uh, work towards fulfilling these fields. Um, at least I try in my work on family policies. Um, I would like to give you some very general guidance, um, uh, you know, as for young people. First of all, know yourself. Uh, there are tests on core strengths. Um, I, I, I've done recently. I've done um, something called a Science of Well-Being course. You can do it for free on Coursera. It's from Yale University, and um, they give you their uh, tests on your. For example, there's a test on core strengths. So uh, through this test, I found that that my my core strength, which I wasn't aware of really, was the love of learning, and um, and actually it turns out that this is this actually very much aligned with my work because in this, in this kind of job, um, the love of learning is, is indispensable. And, uh, and this is a core strength that's really vital for, for a job at the UN, where you need to reinvent yourself, you find issues of importance in your field, focus on them, keep researching, keep network, networking with experts. Uh, number two, is to keep learning. This is obvious in our changing world, but it's not just about knowledge. It's also about learning from others and seeing their perspective. Number three, I would say, listen, be respectful of different cultures, try to understand others' perspective. Um, it's a must at the UN and it's not always easy. And number four, be flexible. Uh, from my own experience, I tried as a translator, uh, 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 trying to be a translator, then I, you know, I went through many, uh, you know, uh, fields, and, and then I decided on social field, and um, 
and uh, you know flexibility is really important because some you know things change uh, com uh, the level of competitiveness in specific fields may be maybe too high you have to know um you have to be flexible to to adapt and to um, develop new interests if it need be and um, enjoy the journey and never think that you reach the final goal be optimistic and um just to say that I'm, I'm always trying to be optimistic and uh, if you are not, if you have doubts about if it's worth to be optimistic in, in today's world, I would uh, like you to uh, try to read Factfulness by Hans Rosling or Steven Pinker, Enlightenment or Progress, The Reasons to Look Forward to the Future by Johan Norberg. Um, the most important thing uh, in any profession and in life is in general is to have a positive outlook to believe that each one of us matters, that each one of us can make a difference. Um, and it's easy to be lost in the negativity. The media thrives on negativity and we are fully immersed in it, but we don't have to be, so it's, it's up to you. And uh, just to let you know that I um, uh, sometimes I look at statistics and, and um, it, you know, barometers of uh, well-being uh, around the world and guess what the top regrets people have when they are old already. So number one regret that people have is, I wish I had a life true to myself, not like others expected of me. And I wish I hadn't compared myself to others. Number two regret is, I wish I hadn't worked so much and I wish I made more time for my family. And number two, Ten regret is I wish I had touched more lives and inspired more people. So I wish you not to have at least these three regrets, and I hope I inspired you to consider working at the UN. Thank you. I also have a few questions that I uh, probably I already answered many of them, but I re I received a question from Franciszek from Poland about internships. So. Um, just to let you know that internships, uh, as far as I know, can be done remotely nowadays. Um, at the UN career website, there are some offerings there. If you are interested in social field, you can directly write to me. Um, uh, my email is my, maybe you can leave it later, but you know, you, I can follow up with colleagues who um, know more about this. So if it's social field, please, uh, you can talk to me directly. And um, Yacinta from Kenya is asking about young people how to start a career. So I mentioned YPP is the most straightforward, straightforward way. Um, how does one package a job application? Jane from Kenya. Uh, so uh, the, the recruitment process um, is computer revised, uh, reviewed first. So meaning that when you apply for a job, you have to include some catchphrases in your application. Um, so you have to read very carefully the job description and then when you have a specific qualification you have to mention it and not just once, you have to mention it several times because the, um, it's machine read by, read by sections. So, so even if you think you repeat yourself, that's okay. You, you state the most important things that relate to the, to the um, requirements in uh, each part of the application. Um, so that's uh, practical. Now, what else do we have? Um, we have, yeah, I think, yes, about, um, about COVID. Yes, so, um, yes, how did COVID affect the job opportunities? Yes, so unfortunately, even in the uh, pre-COVID time, um, UN um, had some cash um, cash flow issues. So basically, member states, um, even if they pledged to pay their members, um, they were late. So it was very difficult to organize the budget, and uh, there were a lot of uh, cuts um, in the budget, and um, um, many posts were, uh, even if, let's say, someone retired, the post was not advertised, um, it was kept just to save money. So the, the situation is improving slowly, but there may be issues till the end of the year with, with this. So, um, and also due to COVID, um, I, I think the recruitment process is uh, temporarily frozen. Um, uh, 
and I also checked with UNICEF and it seems that it's a similar situation. Um, and another question is from Ivan uh, from Peru. Considering the upcoming post-COVID era, how will the pattern and jobs within the UN change? Well, my own prediction is that the strong IT skills will be uh, even more important in the post-COVID area and flexibility. And uh, I think that work, working remotely, I mean, the organization also saves money. So probably um, it will be a hybrid, like in schools we have the hybrid uh, learning, we'll probably have the telecommuting and um, physical presence at headquarters or other utilization. Um, they will be uh, probably more flexible and, um, and uh, the staff will be able to, um, I think you are uh, just being here, be interested in, in the, in the is in family issues, social policy issues uh, indicates that you are already, you know, very much interested. And that's the most important thing, to have a passion and be interested in the issues and you, you can succeed in any field. Thank you.